Hello everyone, it's me from the internet, and we're here to talk about technology yet again. So, hope you're sitting down and in a comfy place. First article that I want to talk about is students get less with high-tech teaching. And this article is talking about how the author Ben Fink and Robin Brown both believe that labor-saving devices lead to staff reductions and increase workloads. And it does state about some of the most popular things, which are smart boards to LCD projectors to blogs and wikis that are really great and we use them every day. But it goes on in the second half of the article to talk about state colleges like CCSU, my alma mater, and a bunch of others that are encouraged, parentheses, if not required, end parentheses, to take online classes. So I wanna stop right there and talk about the discrepancy of how I feel when it comes to these online classes. First, a look at what I don't like. It requires a high skill set in executive function and time management. You need to know when your assignments are due and when you have the time to do them. It requires computers are up to having multiple windows open at any given time. It requires an understanding of modules. It requires an understanding of decision discussion groups and individual contact information. It requires the use of a school email address as opposed to a personal email address. It does not allow for individualized instruction. It does not allow for self-generated groups. Sometimes tests and quizzes are timed. Sometimes tests and quizzes are limited to one attempt. If internet or method of obtaining coursework is not reliable, the site can crash and work can be misrepresented in the grading. It's easy to open notes and cheat when you're not supposed to do so. And now, what I do like about it. You can multitask. You don't need to dress appropriately and look the part of the professional role. You can be in your PJs. Depending on the professor, work can be completed as soon as it becomes available, so you can be a ahead of the game. You can open additional windows as needed to refer to notes and make changes. You can use screen grab programs, if you own them, to save video modules. You don't need to be in a room, exchange physical papers in order to get sick with your classmates. It saves paper, which saves trees, which is good for the environment. Now, for a visual comparison of the likes and dislikes, you can see that the dislikes are 11, whereas the likes are only 7. I think it's pretty clear where I stand in the online classes. Continuing with the article, they move away from the state schools, such as Central, and into the private schools and the Ivy League school, such as Yale and state that these teachers know exactly what they're doing because that's what works. Yale has access to every learning technology imaginable, yet it knows how students learn best, not through labor saving devices, but through lots of labor. And their classes are taught in 15 to 20 student seminars which means more individualization, more care from one instructor 
to a good ratio of students. And when you're in the classroom, you get the opportunity to have that rapport. And let's say a student has a question about a new material, they can ask and get that answer as soon as that is provided to them. And by having that question open to a discussion right there, not only the student who was brave enough to ask the question or smart enough to ask the question will get the answer, but everyone else in the classroom will get the answer or at least refresh their memory in case they already knew it. So I really like this article, even though it seems a little cynical, but it makes sense in the long run that in the classroom with low tech solutions seems pretty good for what's been working for the past umpteen years. If you thought that last article was cynical, you should check out this one posted in the USA Today newspaper on April 8th, 2015. YouTube Kids App Cries for Regulation. And it was written by John Sinnall, who said, and I quote, it's the most anti-family idea ever. Kids need human to human interaction for child development, which I totally and completely understand. I've said in the past that there should be a time where there's no technology. A good idea for that is during the dinner table because at the dinner table, you have communication of your day. You learn more about each other in those, you know, 30 minutes than you would all day long. So to have that no tech time is important to show you matter to me for kids. And having the YouTube kids app specifically relating only to advertisers is so crazy. We've done enough with advertisements. Now, what I like about the article is it says, and this is kind of lambasting, I just learned that word. It's kind of lambasting YouTube and stating how technology workers only life ambition is to code software products or sell advertising. And it's true if what he wrote about freezing eggs for later using to create their families is really the case. I mean, other companies like Amazon, which is a tech-based company, has been known to say, we are going to give you not six weeks, but six months of maternity leave and pay you handsomely because children are our future. And we want you to feel that you are going to have a job when you come back from that pregnancy. Go and spend as much time as you need because you are important to us. So let's delve more into the YouTube Kids app, which I found available on iTunes. iTunes boasts that the official YouTube Kids app is designed for curious little minds to dive into a world of discovery, learning, and entertainment. This is a delightfully simple and free app where kids can discover videos, channels, and playlists they love. Um, I've shortened what they've said about it, but in the section designed for kids, they can see shows, music, learning, and explore. In videos kids will love includes Sesame Street, Thomas and Friends, Talking Tom, online hits, and other things. And grown-ups are in control, that part a lot of parents are very much interested in. One of the list of things was the built-in timer that parents can activate to stop kids from watching so they don't have to remember that themselves. Now, I want to get out of this cynical part and move into the supporter part of tech supporters. 
and the next two articles that do show the support happen to be about Manchester Public Schools, which I'm so proud to say I'm currently working in district, although not exactly in the position I want, but you'll get my point. I love Manchester for this. I'm so jealous of this article here, Computer Science Lesson Launched. And this is a program that talks about a nationwide effort promoting computer education. Waddell Elementary School in Manchester, Connecticut is learning basic programming to promote their computer education and part of the core curriculum. It teaches writing computer coding book reports and entering information into robots to complete tasks. The ideas are to integrate technology with science, mathematics, language arts, and meant to promote creativity and collaboration and exchange or encourage logical thinking, which is preparing them for the real world of high paid and most sought positions. The Hour of Code promoted by code.org seems to be this really outrageously awesome thing that kids can tell a little bee where to go based on their knowledge of coding. <laughs> and where they're sending that be. And then the kids get to see, oh, I put these numbers into this program here, and that is the outcome. I'd go a step further and say that you can see this as a direct correlation of behavior to outcome, and special education teachers can use this as a behavior management technique for, okay, how did you make the B move? So you put in an action. What do you think happens when you put in the action of hitting a classmate, coming to class late? The outcome is X, Y, Z. That's just the way my brain works because I have that um, special education training background. Okay, okay. So I kind of overspoke about this article being about Manchester Public Schools, but it is because even though it started off at Buckley in Hartford, it went in September of this past, of this school year to Manchester High School and Illing Min, uh, Middle School in Manchester. And the concept is a Google cardboard virtual reality contraption known as Expeditions Pioneer, where students actually get to wear this thing and take a three-dimensional virtual tour of places and learn about them. So you've got science, you've got social studies, you've got everything tied into this one technology-based machine, and I think it's pretty cool. I w only wish that I could have explored this myself and put it on, see how it felt. I know that YouTube has some 3D things, especially in that kids app that I talked about. I saw that as a possibility for the new versions. So the one of the students initially asked to skip the exercise because she preferred the simplicity of a paper and pen as to distracting computer screen. But in seeing this, it's accessible to everyone. For urban kids that struggle in the city that rarely have the opportunity to leave their neighborhoods, let alone city, the implications are huge. And that was an exact quote from the article. Um, being able to take virtual field trips is great. When I was in high school, I was so distraught over the fact that I didn't ask to go on the DC trip or the Quebec trip because I knew if I stayed in French class, I could go to the Paris, France trip. As soon as I was a freshman in high school, 
9-11 happened and all foreign trips were put to a stop. So now that the world has gotten to be kind of a scarier place or based on monetary restrictions, you might want to look into something like 3D goggles for your field trips and see what can you learn this way. Though you don't get the tactile touch of actually going there, you don't get the fresh air, you don't get the human interaction, you can still see things differently, which is a pretty cool idea. Lastly, there was an article back in November in something called a holiday gift guide that talked about buying tech for your kids and three tips for kid tech success. Number one, don't tech too soon. While it's good to learn these things, once you learn them, you're kind of hooked for life. Number two, set ground rules. Now this is something that you need to be paying attention to as so yourself. Only set a number of texts or minutes on a device and no technology during certain times like dinner or during homework time unless it's needed for that homework. And number three is do your research. This is for parents or the provider of that tech toy. You need to know if it's going to fit into your household and your set of guidelines for your lifestyle.